Good evening. My name is Jeff Bradshaw, and on behalf of the Interpreter Foundation, Book of Mormon Central, and Fair Latter-day Saints, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to each of you. We're very pleased to be hearing a presentation by R. Gene Adams entitled, Aftermath of the Martyrdom, Aspirants to the Mantle of Joseph Smith. Our opening prayer will be given by Charles Elledge. Following the prayer, we'll have an introduction by Richard E. Turley. Before his retirement, Rick served as an assistant church historian and later as managing director of the church's public affairs department. Our closing prayer will be given by Kathy Elledge. After the closing prayer, Gene will be happy to answer questions. To submit questions, please text 208-991-0315 anytime during the presentation. Father in heaven, we are grateful for the opportunity to learn. We're thankful for the blessing of the gospel. We're thankful for the erudition of Brother Adams, for his work and his diligence. We pray that the Spirit will attend him tonight as he enlightens us, that we may learn more and become uh, more aware of the sacrifices and the genius of uh, Joseph Smith. And we say this name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome to this evening's fireside, Aftermath of the Martyrdom, the aspirants to the mantle of Joseph Smith and the leadership of Brigham Young in the months following the martyrdom. The presenter this evening is R. Gene Adams, who holds a BS in accounting and an MBA from the University of Utah, and over his career has published several articles and a book on Latter-day Saint history. Gene is a longtime volunteer, Institute of Religion instructor, and has served as president of the John Whitmer Historical Association. He is an active member of the Mormon History Association, the Sons of the Utah Pioneers, and the Missouri Mormon Frontier Foundation. While serving missions in the Northeastern United States, some members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints experienced feelings of foreboding on June 27, 1844, the day the church's senior leaders, the prophet Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram, were martyred. The apostles' promptings led them to return hastily to Nauvoo, Illinois, the church's headquarters, where assembled church members voted resoundingly to have Brigham Young and the Twelve lead the church instead of Sidney Rigdon. Gene will discuss this succession in leadership and explore the efforts of several other aspirants to claim the mantle of the deceased prophet Joseph Smith. He will examine the solidifying influence on the church of Brigham Young and the Twelve. Finally, Jean will recount the exodus of the majority of the saints from Western Illinois to Iowa in early 1846, Young's continuing efforts over several more years to deal with scattered church members, and his counsel and direction to apostles facilitating the trek westward from Canesville, Iowa in the years that followed. Gene's fireside address will show how the essential work of Joseph Smith continued after his death and how those on whom the prophet had bestowed all the priesthood keys perpetuated the restoration that he began. Succession in the presidency of the church is a critical teaching and the basis for its continuing work, recently reiterated by President Russell M. Nelson, to invite all of God's children on both sides of the veil to come unto the Savior receive the blessings of the Holy Temple, have enduring joy, and qualify for eternal life. My topic tonight is the aftermath of the martyrdom, the aspirants to the mantle of Joseph Smith. First of all, I'd like to thank the Interpreter Foundation for the opportunity to once again talk in terms of the uh, uh, great uh, message and role and model of Joseph Smith. In this presentation, we will explore the various claims and results of efforts by several aspirants to the merit to, to merit the mantle of the deceased prophet Joseph Smith following his martyrdom on June 27, 1844. In addition to a better appreciation of the leadership provided by Brigham Young in gathering to Utah, it is my sincere hope that all of us will gain a better understanding of our brothers and sisters who are members of the various expressions of the Restoration. That is, those who believe Joseph Smith was indeed their founding prophet, but are not affiliated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In my introduction to this subject, I want to cover a few general uh, pieces of information, some terminology, and some common ground criteria. 
there have been numerous separations from the original church during the 191 years since its founding on April the 6th, 1830. In fact, there have been approximately 500 separations since 1831. It is estimated that there are about 125 separate church organizations functioning today, not counting the independent restoration branches who claim their beginning as a church in 1830. Before beginning our specific topic for tonight's fireside, however, I would like to discuss some terminology that might be generally familiar, but may need a little clarification. Mormons, Mormonites. These are early tags for those who joined or followed Joseph Smith and or were believers in the Book of Mormon. Latter-day Saints or LDS represents the change in the name of the original church in 1834 from the Church of Christ to the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Revelation to formalize the name to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was given to Joseph Smith by Revelation in April 1838. Saints, used by both the Latter-day Saints and the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, often tagged RLDS, changed its name to Community of Christ on January 1, 2001. ITES. We all are familiar with the term ITE and should be familiar if we've indulged in reading the Book of Mormon. Basically, it is a distinguishing add-on to the name of the primary person or organization with whom the followers of that person or organization identify themselves. Thus, we have the following. Brighamites, or Twelveites, Josephites, or Reorganites, Rigdonites, Bickertonites, Strangites, Whiteites, Hedrickites, Cutlerites, Whitmerites, Smithites, Bishopites, Roosterites, Thompsonites, Gladnites, etc. That's a mouthful. Schisms. I tried to avoid the use of the term schism and other similar terms such as break off or splinter group. No organization likes to be called or referred to as such. A more acceptable term is an expression of the restoration. Most of the various expressions of the restoration do not like or specifically reject the above mentioned terms, the ites, the Mormons, the saints, LDS, etc. So what are the common ground criteria? I have chosen six as being generally found within the tenets of any group that chose to follow one of the aspirants to the mantle of the prophet Joseph Smith. They are Joseph Smith. Makes sense. He's the proclaimed prophet and founder of the restored church of Jesus Christ. The Book of Mormon. Most of the various expressions feel strongly about the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. The keystone of our religion. Community of Christ accommodates a range of individual perspectives. Joseph Smith's reported revelations are found in the Book of Commandments, 1833, and the Doctrine and Covenants, 1835, and thereafter. Four, revelation is an ongoing process to leaders of the various expressions. There's a wide range of what is included within this spectrum of the various expressions. For instance, the Church of Jesus Christ's position is that any member might receive a revelation for the church as long as it is subsequently sanctioned by the church. Within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, only the prophet receives revelation for the church. Other leaders and individuals may receive revelation for their area of responsibility, family, or person. Five, the gathering. The first gathering was to Kirtland. The original church moved from New York to Ohio in 1831 then to Missouri, 1831 to 1838 period, and then to Illinois for most of 1839-1845. So we have the Nauvoo Temple. Early gatherings by these various expressions thereafter have included Pennsylvania, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Kansas, and a return to Missouri. Later, subsequent movements have included Northern Mexico, Alberta, Canada, 
Arizona, Montana, and South Dakota. The future city, number six, the future city of the New Jerusalem will be located in Jackson County, Missouri, according to Revelation first proclaimed by the prophet Joseph Smith in 1831. Many of the expressions additionally subscribe to the tenet that the church will return to Jackson County at some future time, thus the redemption of Zion, first used in 1834 and thereafter. Additionally, many of the expressions believe that the Millennial Temple will be built on the Temple Lot property, 63.27 acres, purchased by Bishop Edward Partridge in December 1831 in Independence, Jackson County, Missouri. The Community of Christ built and dedicated a temple on the Temple Lot property in 1994. However, the church does not connect the temple with millennial expectations. The Church of Jesus Christ believes that the New Jerusalem will be located somewhere in the Americas, but not necessarily Jackson County. So let us begin with the expressions of the restoration. From the earliest years of the restored church, there have been individuals or groups of individuals that have disagreed with either Joseph Smith or the revealed doctrine of the church. These expressions of the restoration have been categorized as either early or late periods. For each time frame, I will note the primary individual who initiated a separation from the body of the original church with a very brief sketch. For the early period, this is pre-martyrdom, I will only mention four uh, significant personalities. Uh, Wycombe Clark, 1831, Kirtland, his church was called the Pure Church of Christ. Number two, Warren Parrish, uh, along with several others, in Kirtland, 1837. They entitled their church the Church of Christ, the original name of the church. Included among those who separated here um, and associated with Parish when Joseph left for far west include John Boynton and Lyman and Luke Johnson, both members of the original Quorum of the Twelve. Also, Martin Harris, one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon. The third, George Hinkle, 1840, uh, organized a church in Moscow, Iowa. He named it the Church of Jesus Christ, the Bride, the Lamb's Wife. And four, William Law, early 1844 in Nauvoo, right in the midst of all the activity and, and so forth that was taking place there. Uh, his church was the true Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Law had been second counselor to Smith's, in Smith's first presidency, but was dropped from this position in early 1844 and subsequently excommunicated for apostasy in April 1844. For the late period, 1844 and beyond, I've selected 10 significant personalities that had a direct impact on the aftermath of the martyrdom of the prophet Joseph Smith. Number one, Brigham Young and the Quorum of Twelve Apostles. They assumed control of the church in August 1844. Young was president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As such, he was the key figure in the immediate aftermath of the martyrdom. Young guided the church out of Nauvoo in 1846 and onto the Great Basin of the American West in 1847-1848. Young died in 1877. Next, James Strang, an elder in the original church, 1844. Strang recruited, led, and organized perhaps as many as 2,000 to 3,000 followers from Nauvoo and elsewhere. He retained the same 1844 name of the church for his organization. Strang died from assassin's attack on Beaver Island in Lake Michigan 1856. William Smith, apostle, patriarch, and brother of the prophet, 1845. He claimed that he was equal with his brother Hiram, who was assistant president of the church by lineal descent and to his ordained offices. William Smith claimed also that he had the right and authority to take charge of the church. After a falling out with Brigham Young, 
he initially aligned himself with Strang. Smith left Strang's organization and started his own church in 1847-1848, using the same name as the original 1844 church. When that effort floundered, Smith next affiliated with White's church in Texas for a brief period. In later life, he joined with the RLDS, but held no senior leadership position. He died in 1893. Lyman White, Apostle, 1845. With Brigham Young's initial but reluctant permission, White led a colony of approximately 150 members uh, to Austin, Texas uh, in 1845-1846. He eventually broke with Young in 1848 and formed his own church. White died 10 years later in 1858. Granville Hedrick, Elder. 1852, he organized several branches of the original church located in North Central Illinois into a consolidated church, which was renamed the Crow Creek Branch of the Church of Christ. Hedrick claimed that he was directed by revelation to return to, quote, consecrated land, which I have appointed and dedicated by my servant Joseph Smith in Jackson County, state of Missouri, end quote. Approximately 100 members made the difficult trek in the early winter of 1867. Joseph Smith III, son of the prophet Joseph. Smith was ordained president of the high priesthood in 1860 at a conference of the new organization in Amboy, Illinois. He later moved from Nauvoo to Plano in 1866 and then to Lamoni, Iowa in 1881. 25 years later, in 1906, Smith relocated to Independence. He died in 1914. Sidney Rigdon, first counselor in the first presidency at the time of Smith's murder. After Rigdon's efforts to lead the church's guardian following the death of Smith was rejected in August, he led his followers and organized a church in Pennsylvania later in 1844-1845. When this movement disintegrated, he moved to New York. Rigdon made a second attempt to organize a church in 1863, again in Pennsylvania. However, within a relatively short period of time, this organization also floundered. Rigdon returned to Friendship, New York, where in 1876 he died. William Bickerton, Elder. Bickerton was an early disciple of Rigdon, 1845. He left Rigdon when Rigdon's first church disintegrated and was baptized a Latter-day Saint in 1851 in Pennsylvania. He left the LDS church a year later and soon thereafter regrouped many of his former congregants along with many of Rigdon's followers and organized his own church. Alpheus Cutler. Cutler was a high priest in the church in the 1840s. Um, he moved to uh, Southwest Iowa. And uh, at a certain point in time, Cutler refused counsel from Apostle Orson Hyde and others to continue west to Utah Territory after living, as I mentioned, several years in, in Southwest Iowa following the exodus from Nauvoo. Instead, he physically separated from the church and moved with his adherents to a new area of Southwest Iowa, some 30 miles distant, which they named Manti. Plans were made to move the church to Minnesota in 1864. Soon thereafter, however, after the plans were made, Cutler died. His followers carried out the relocation plan the following year in 1865. David Whitmer, one of the three witnesses and the first president of the Missouri State, 1834-1838. Whitmer left far west Missouri in 1838 under duress and relocated to Richmond, Missouri, where he lived the rest of his life. In January 1847, William McClellan announced the organization of the Church of Christ in Kirtland, Ohio, McClellan having been one of the original members of the Quorum of the Twelve, but had left also. And uh, when he made this announcement, uh, he, he made the, the point that uh, the church was going to be led by none other than David Whitmer. It appears, however, that Whitmer never made the trip to Kirtland or accepted the position. However, later in life, 1875-1876, Whitmer did organize a church in Richmond, Missouri, 
He died 10 years later, approximately in 1888. Other well-known personalities who moved between the various postmortem groups or expressions include William McClellan, who I just mentioned, an apostle, Johnny Page, an apostle, and uh, the third person that you show up here is William Marks, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, McClellan and Page were both at one time associated with Granville Hedrick in the Church of Christ. Both had been with another expression of the Restoration before joining Hedrick, and both left the Church of Christ within a short period of time after their joining. And William Marks, high priest and former Nauvoo State President, Marks associated with James Strang before aligning himself with a new organization. So, let us discuss what I term the claim. Question, why all the confusion regarding leadership of the church in the postmodernism period? Answer, Joseph Smith left no clear instruction to the church. Certainly Joseph designated, implied or otherwise, different individuals as his, as his successor at different times. Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, Hiram Smith. Both Cowdery and Hiram Smith were specifically designated as assistant president. However, Joseph did not publicly announce a method of transition or successorship prior to his death. Because of that lack of knowledge among the members of the church, a number of men over the next several years following Smith's death stepped forward to claim the mantle of the deceased prophet. Postmortem expressions of the Restoration. What developed out of the uh, personalities and their efforts of those earlier aspirants to the mantle? This chart shows five of the major expressions of the Restoration and a general timeline for their emergence. We're now going to explore those five, and I hope you can see them well enough. Uh, Sidney Rigdon, William Bickerton, the Church of Jesus Christ, followed by Granville Hedrick, uh, Joseph Smith III in the Community of Christ, formerly RLDS, uh, James Strang, and the last one being Brigham Young in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're going to explore those five plus two additional expressions for a total of seven expressions that emerged in the post-martyrdom period, which had a significant impact on the original church and its membership. They are as follows. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The LDS position is that Joseph Smith did give the necessary authority by revelation. Doctrine and Covenants, section 107, verses 23 and 24, uh, in 1835. Uh, the Quorum of the Twelve, that is the Twelve Apostles, were equal in authority to the First Presidency. Furthermore, shortly before his death, at a meeting of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, held in April 1844, Joseph Smith instructed members of, of, the, of the Quorum uh, on significant points of doctrine. As recorded by Apostle Wilford Woodruff, who was present at this important gathering, Smith, after imparting what was on his mind, declared, I have rolled off the kingdom upon your shoulders. Following Smith's murder, the Quorum of Twelve Apostles assumed the leadership of the church based on the 1835 revelation and the April 1844 instruction. In a previous fireside, Ron Esplin has enlightened us on the August 8th special conference that was hurriedly arranged after Brigham Young's return to Nauvoo, which was several days later than Sidney Rigdon's arrival. It was at this conference that Rigdon made his formal claim as guardian for the church until young Joseph, the son of Joseph Smith, became old enough to assume his place as his father's successor. He did so in the morning session. When Young spoke to the congregation in the afternoon session on the role and responsibility of the Twelve, many of the saints attending later testified that they saw Joseph speaking to them instead of Brigham. Others heard what they perceived as Joseph's voice. Some have questioned the number and strength of these accounts, but most Latter-day Saint historians 
quote, acknowledged the mantle's story, agreeing that something important happened in August 1844. For example, Ron Eslin states, quote, though there is no contemporary diary account, the number of later retellings, many in remarkable detail, argues for the reality of some such experience, end quote. In a book edited by John W. Welch, 68 first-hand accounts of the experience and 61 second-hand accounts have been collected and analyzed. These reported events convinced themselves and many others that they saw and felt the transition of the mantle of the prophet passed from Joseph to Brigham. When the choice was presented to the assembled saints that afternoon, the vote to follow Young and the Twelve was unanimous. Rigdon soon left Nauvoo and returned to Pittsburgh. Young, as president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, took charge of the church. In December 1847, Young formally reorganized the First Presidency at Canesville, Iowa. Number two, the new organization, Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, now Community of Christ. The Community of Christ position is that Joseph Smith III was on more than one occasion blessed by his father, quote, to be my successor to the presidency of the high priesthood, end quote. Lineal descent was important, but not the only factor. At the time of his father's murder, young Smith was only 11 years old. 16 years later, Joseph agreed to take, quote, his father's place at the April 1860 conference of the new organization held at Amboy, Illinois. The reorganization movement actually began in 1852 as the new organization and later incorporated under the name of the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1872. Prior to that day, the name of the church was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In 2000, the church adopted and voted on a change of the name to Community of Christ while legally retaining their uh, incorporated name and did so on January 1, 2001. Number three, the Church of Christ Temple Lot. In December 1860, the Crow Creek branch of the original Church of Christ voted to return to the original 1830 name, i.e. the Church of Christ. The parenthetical inclusion of Temple Lot is not part of the legal name of the church, but is used to distinguish itself from several other denominations that use the, uh, the name the Church of Christ. Um, Granville Hedrick claimed a revelation in 1864, as I mentioned earlier, to return to Jackson County in 1867 and reclaim the Temple Lot property. The Church of Christ was the first expression of the restoration to return to Independence, Jackson County. About 100 members left North Central Illinois and traveled to Jackson County in the winter of 1867. Today, the Church of Christ owns two, uh, three and one quarter acres in the northwest corner of the Temple Lot property of the original 63.27 acres um, and presumably the spot where Joseph set a stone at the north, uh, northeast corner and dedicated the ground for the Millennial Temple on August the 3rd, 1831. Four, James Strang and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints with the parenthetical enclosure Strangite. An 1844 letter, considered a forgery by many, addressed to James Strang from Joseph Smith, named him successor in the case of Joseph's death. Strang also reported an angelic confirmation on that very evening of the martyrdom, June the 27th, 1844. Later, Strang claimed a revelation that specifically directed him to the recovery of ancient plates from a nearby hill near Burlington, Wisconsin. Strang subsequently translated the plates, which contain a record of early inhabitants of the area. Five, the Church of Jesus Christ. As first counselor in Joseph's first presidency, Signe Rigdon initially claimed to be the guardian until young Joseph the third came of Asian after his father's death. Rigdon then left Nauvoo prior to the 
uh, the murder of, of Smith at Carthage for Pennsylvania, but upon hearing of Smith's death, returned immediately to Nauvoo to make his claim. He arrived prior to the return of Young and the other apostles and began advocating his, his claim as guardian. On August the 8th, 1844, at a special conference of the church in Nauvoo, his claim was rejected, as I previously mentioned, and he left Nauvoo sometimes thereafter for Pennsylvania, where he organized the Church of Christ in 1844-1845. This early expression eventually disintegrated, as did a subsequent attempt in the 1860s. Later, however, William Bickerton, an early advent ad adherent of Rigdon's, gathered many of his followers, as well as his own, and organized the Church of Jesus Christ in 1862. William Smith and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. William Smith, as previously mentioned, was an apostle in the original Quorum of the Twelve. He was also the younger brother of both the prophet and patriarch. Following the death of his brother Hiram, William was ordained church patriarch. He soon claimed he was the rightful heir to his brother's mantle by lineage. After a falling out with Brigham Young, he initially aligned himself with Strang, but that experience was short-lived. He started his own church organization in 1847, 1848, Headquarters were nominally in Covington, Kentucky, until 1850, when the church disintegrated. Lyman Wright and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. By prior assignment from Joseph Smith in early 1844, Lyman White, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, had been designated as one of four members of the so-called Texas Commission to search out a possible area of relocation for the church. In spite of differences in the months following Smith's assassination, White finally convinced Young that he and approximately 150 men, women, and children of the Wisconsin Black River Lumber Company should go to Texas as had been planned earlier. They left Nauvoo in September 1845 for a 1,400-mile trek to Austin, Texas. After a two-year effort by Brigham Young to reconcile with White failed, White and his company separated from the Young-led church. White proceeded to organize the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on January 1, 1849. In the years following the death of Joseph Smith at Carthage in June 1844, there were other men, besides those that we discuss, who claimed visions, revelations, or direct inspiration to lead and guide the church and subsequently established their own expressions of the Restoration. An important aspect of our discussion tonight is understanding membership and priesthood as generally viewed by the various expressions of the Restoration. Let me begin with membership. An individual joined or became a member of the church at baptism. That membership could be terminated either by the church or by the individual. But in most cases, the baptism continued to be recognized thereafter by the expression with whom the person later became associated or affiliated. That ongoing justification was based on one of three possibilities. The original church had fallen away, had become disorganized, or that the church or expression that they were a member of, or to the expression they later joined, claimed to be the original. Priesthood. Priesthood and ordination to any designated office within the priesthood was retained by the individual regardless of how that individual was separated from the, or, or the original church. Additionally, ordination to priesthood offices can also be authorized by revelation. Here are some examples. Within the new organization, the forerunner to the RLDS church, Jason W. Briggs and Zenas H. Gurley Sr., elders in the original church and later joined by others, assimilated existing branches of the original church in southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois into the new organization, beginning in 1852. In April 1853, both Briggs and Gurley were chosen by revelation and ordained apostles. Over the ensuing years, these men and others, including William Marks, former state president in Nauvoo, 
urged Joseph Smith III to take his father's place as head of the church. They were convinced by individual revelation that young Joseph was the rightful heir by lineal descent. They succeeded in their efforts in 1860. Gurley of the Quorum of Twelve and Marx of the High Priest ordained Joseph Smith III, quote, president of the High Priesthood, end quote, at the April conference of the new organization held in Amboy, Illinois. In the years following Joseph's death, early church apostles, William McClellan, Johnny Page, William Smith, all conferred upon other men the Melchizedek priesthood and ordained them to the office of an apostle. For instance, Johnny Page ordained Granville Hedrick as an apostle in 1863, after he became a member of the Church of Christ the previous year. Holding the Melchizedek priesthood was sufficient to adorn, uh, ordain other men to any office considered to be a designated office within the scope of the Melchizedek priesthood. James Strang and William Bickerton fit into this category. So, after Nauvoo, where did these expressions gather to over time? Well, the one that most of us are probably familiar with is the exodus from Nauvoo to Utah Territory via Iowa. Brigham Young and the majority of the membership of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints left Illinois beginning in February 1846. They established headquarters in western Iowa and eastern Nebraska, and then in 1847, 1848, continued their trek to the Great Basin of the American West, which took place over several years. Next. As a result of the, the Mexican War, this geographical area became U.S. territory after Young's arrival in 47-48. Headquarters of the church were established in Salt Lake City and have been maintained there since 1848. James Strang resided in the community of Voree near Burlington, Wisconsin, where there was an existing branch of the original church prior to June 1844. He became active in recruiting followers in Nauvoo and surrounding area immediately following the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. He then directed his followers to gather to Boree. In 1850, Strang relocated church headquarters to Beaver Island in Lake Michigan, as you can see way up on the upper end of the lake. With the murder of Strang in 1856, his adherents were forced off of Beaver Island and scattered. Today, the headquarters are located in Burlington, Wisconsin. Sidney Rigdon, left Nauvoo shortly after the 8, August 8, 1844 Special Conference of the Church and returned to Pennsylvania. William Bickerton, who had once been an adherent of Rigdon's, formally organized the Church of Jesus Christ in Pennsylvania in 1862 and subsequently established Zion Valley, later St. John, Kansas, in 1875, while maintaining a presence in Pennsylvania. Factions within the church were finally reconciled in 1902, and headquarters for the church have been maintained in Mongahela, Pennsylvania, since that time. Several existing branches of the original church located in southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois prior to June 1844 united within the new organization which became the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As mentioned previously, Joseph Smith III was ordained president of the High Priesthood in 1860. He continued to reside in Nauvoo, however, until 1868, when he moved to Plano, Illinois, which became the church headquarters. Church headquarters were subsequently relocated to Lamoni, Iowa in 1881. Smith and other church leaders moved to Independence in the early 1900s. Headquarters of the church were officially relocated to Independence in 1921. The next map, Granville Hedrick lived in Washburn, Illinois, where an early branch of the church was located. Amalgamated with other branches in 1852, the church was subsequently renamed the Church of Christ in 1860. And in 1867, the church relocated to Independence headquarters or in uh, independence and have been maintained there ever since that time, 1867. 
Next, we have Alpheus Cutler. As indicated previously, he initiated, uh, initially traveled to Western Iowa with the mass exodus of the church from Nauvoo in 1846-47. He declined to go further west under Young's directive and organized a new expression, namely the Church of Jesus Christ in southwest Iowa among members of the existing branches of the LDS Church in 1853. The church relocated to Minnesota in 1865 and established headquarters in what became the town of Clitheroe. The church's headquarters were subsequently moved to Independence, Missouri in 1928. Lyman White led his group to Austin, Texas, 1845-1846. Circumstances forced his following there to relocate elsewhere within Texas three times over the next 13 years. The church organization fell apart after White's death in 1858. Most members joined the new organization, now the RLDS, in the years that followed and moved north. Some, however, rejoined the LDS church and traveled west. This map of the United States shows the various gatherings or settlements undertaken by the major expressions of the Restoration in the years following the death of Joseph Smith. And you can gather from that map that's the green star indicating where Nauvoo was or is and uh, the various locations to which they moved. We will now briefly discuss four reasons or, or one of, uh, for following one of the various claimants or the rejection thereof. They were authority issues with Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, James Strang, William Smith, or others. Number two, the rejected gospel or rejected church concept. Number three, the theology of the Nauvoo period. Individuals wanted to return to the Kirtland area theology. The doctrines that bothered many of them were baptism for the dead, the endowment or temple ordinances, specific doctrinal teachings such as Joseph Smith's teachings in the King Follett Discourse, God is as man once was, and God is as man may become. I think I said that right. Man is as God once was, and God is as man may become. And finally, perhaps, the major reason for following or rejecting the leadership of Young and the Quorum of the Twelve, plural marriage, celestial marriage, call it what you will, polygamy. I felt it might be of interest to know the position of the aspirants to the mantle of, the jo of Joseph Smith regarding this controversial subject. Brigham Young and the LDS Church, yes. Rigdon Bickerton, no. Cutler, yes, and then no. Strang, no, and then yes. White, yes. William Smith, no, yes, no. Briggs, Gurley, and Smith, the new organization, the RLDS, no. Hedrick, no. And Whitmer, no. The significance of the return to Jackson County and the redemption of Zion became a driving force for many of the expressions of the restoration following the death of Joseph Smith. I want us to focus uh, at this point of our discussion on independence, Jackson County. This chart shows 19 different expressions of the restoration in independence today. Amazing. Three of these early expressions of the restoration returned to independence between 1867 and 1904 and began to acquire or reacquire the temple lot property as defined in the original 1831 acquisition by Edward Partridge for the early church. And a fourth expression located to independence in 1928. The current Church of Christ Chapel and Headquarters and, and another one lo are located in East Independence. They have initially acquired 2.7 acres in 1867 and later added another half acre. Community of Christ Temple and Headquarters. They have other churches and facilities in the nearby area. 
they acquired 40.5 acres over many years. The LDS Visitor Center is located on land acquired by the LDS Church in 1904. There are other facilities and church buildings located nearby. The above three organizations own between them the 63.27 acres purchased by the original church uh, through uh, Edward Partridge in December 1831. And the fourth that returned Church of Christ, Cutlerite, acquired property nearby in 1928. It's uh, south of the Temple Lot property. So here's a view of the uh, Temple Lot and the buildings today. Uh, the major features that you see, the, the dome is the auditorium of the Community of Christ, the temple being the, the temple of the Community of Christ, uh, and then the LDS and uh, Church of Christ properties to the left and to the right. Another look at the independence chart shows the various later expressions that separated from the church um, from the four that initially established themselves in the independence area between 1867 and 1928. So on the left hand side of the chart, uh, Church of Christ separated into five subsequent groups, including uh, the break off of one group from another. And there I use the word that I don't like to use, expression of the restoration. The middle is the RLDS Community of Christ. And their separated expressions total eight. Um, and we could go down and read them all, but you can kind of gather uh, from them there. And then to the right is the uh, LDS separated expressions, uh, two of which are shown up on the chart. Um, a total of 15 separations have a, have a presence in independence plus the original four equals a total of 19 expressions of the restoration in the independence area. Let us review then the major expressions of the restoration today where they might be located. First of all, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Salt Lake City, Utah. Worldwide population of 16.7 million. Community of Christ, Temple and Headquarters, Independence, Missouri, have a membership of 250,000. The Church of Jesus Christ Headquarters in Mongahela, Pennsylvania, there are worldwide um, estimate of numbers, uh, members is 15 to 20,000. The Church of Christ and its headquarters in Independence, six to 8,000. The Remnant Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, which is uh, directly across the street from the, from the Temple Lot property, about 3,000. Restoration branches in the area, another few thousand. And then the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. These are several separate church organizations included within that title, 40 to 50,000. Three of these major groups include the Apostolic United Brethren Headquarters in Bluffdale, Utah, the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints of about 8,000, and in Centennial Park, Arizona, uh, the Centennial Park, 6,000. A personal comment. President Gordon B. Hinckley often counseled Latter-day Saints that we as individuals needed to be more forgiving, more tolerant, and more understanding. In an eight, April, 19, April 2004 conference address, he said, quote, we can live and work with others, respecting their beliefs and admiring their virtues without surrendering any element of our doctrine. We can be more neighborly, we can be more helpful, end quote. This would certainly include our brothers and sisters in these other expressions of the restoration. On another occasion, he said, let us not dwell on the critical or the negative. May God help us to be a little kinder, 
showing forth greater forbearance and to be more forgiving. I'd like to conclude with my own testimony that Joseph Smith was indeed the Lord's chosen prophet to restore his church in these latter days. That the Book of Mormon is the word of God. That the Doctrine and Covenants contains the Lord's guidance, teachings, and commandments as given to Joseph Smith and his successors for us today. We need a living prophet to guide the Lord's church in these latter days, and we do. President Russell M. Nelson, whom I readily sustain as such. I am eternally grateful for my membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and for the men and women who have sacrificed so much from the beginning of the Restoration to the present time for the gospel of Jesus Christ that we have and we enjoy today. And I do so testify in his holy name. Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this presentation that we've had tonight from Brother Adams. We're grateful for his preparation. We're grateful for the shared testimony <coughs> we have among members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and other expressions of the restoration and the mission of Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon and others of the supreme doctrines of the church, which are vital to our understanding of thy work and thy glory in this particular day and age. We're also grateful for the example of love and brotherhood that we share and for the admonition of President Hinckley to be able to increase our understanding and love and uh, for other groups uh, of all faiths. And uh, we uh, ask thy blessings that we might carry this message in our hearts to others and our own testimonies of our faith. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Gene, you should have some questions uh, in your inbox. I have a couple here. Let me uh, get on with these. Why did Joseph Smith publicly state his succession plan? Uh, frankly, we don't know the answer to that, at least as far as my research and understanding go. He made it certainly clear to the form of the 12 apostles. Uh, and maybe uh, by the time the next conference of the church would have rolled around that may have been uh, announced but it just didn't happen uh, next question did he fear this would inflame the enemies of the church and put other people's lives in danger he was very concerned about that uh, as a matter of fact one of the reasons he announced that he was willing to be sacrificed for the church rather than to have Nauvoo destroyed and the people killed and and run out in Missouri all over again. But uh, whether that factored into his uh, lack of a public announcement, I guess we just don't know. Uh, the next question of the various expressions of the restoration, how many continue today with some substance of active congregations? That is the uh, about 125. And I thank the great research of my dear friend, uh, Stephen Shields who has been a great researcher on all that information and has recently updated his, um, his, his publication called The Virgin Expressions of the Restoration. Those are the questions I've got, Jeff, unless there's some others. That's it. Thank you very much, Gene, and good night to all. Thank you.